to a post office and I put on my mask. And of course I was the only one masked at the post office. And as I was, I was waiting though. And even though I was the only one who was masked, everyone kept their distance. Now, I don't know if it was because of COVID or because I smelled bad. Now, because I don't have COVID, I can smell and I know that I don't smell that bad. So I don't know why they were keeping their distance if they didn't have a mask, but they believed in distance. Inconsistent. Anyway, I go to the post office, which, which is something that young people don't do. So that that makes me suspect. I'm, I, I must not be young. I went to the post office because young people, they don't believe in stamps or post offices. They just like, can I just TikTok this? Can I? I, I can PDF this, right? But as I was waiting, I saw this. I saw this form. I saw a registration, a voter registration application that you can just pick up and you can fill it out online if you haven't, if you haven't done so yet. I mean, I'm in California and we're in a state where if you're in California, if you're Asian American, and this show is really for AAPI and the AAXs and the AAFs, Asian American Filipinos. Uh, if you haven't registered to vote, you have until 15 days before the election. And we are still 15 days out. There is still time to, to register. There's a 15 day deadline. And so if you haven't registered to vote, this is the time to register to vote. Uh, I will say that there have been times in the course of my being an American I've been an American all my life, but in my voting life, I've often wondered, God, it's so confusing to vote, so confusing to register. But this is the time where you should know help is available. You can be a registered voter. And if you have any problems, you can call this number. Call the Secretary of State, 1-800-345-VOTE, 1-800-345-VOTE, or 8683 Call the, call the secretary, California Secretary of State. But you can register to vote. You could do so up to 15 days before the election. And even if you kind of come close and miss, you can contact your county officials and you can register to vote. I say this because early voting has begun. Some people are already going to the party and voting. You should vote. And it's important because... Some of the things that are coming up, you'll see debates nationwide uh, and everything nationwide in the midterms matters because it's about control of the Congress. And if a Senate seat is lost or won in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Georgia, in Nevada, those four states, those are critical. And you want to make sure that your vote is counted here in California. Well, I'm in California. But there's lots of stuff here in California worth voting for. These gambling initiatives that all should be put put off because they're all for special interest. All sorts of things. We'll, we'll talk about that the closer we get to Election Day. But first, you've got to vote. Oh, here's the most important reason why you got to vote. The most important reason you got to vote is the Fifth Circuit Court declare, declared DACA, the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals, plan that Obama set forth, he declared it, uh, the, the court declared it illegal, sent it back to Texas, who's suing to try to stop DACA. It was an executive order put forth by President Obama, has been through the courts. It's a political football. I talk to immigration advocates and they tell me that the only way we're going to make DACA work for everyone, meaning pathway to citizenship, make everyone happy, is if there's comprehensive immigration reform. And the only way you're going to get comprehensive immigration reform is if you, a DACA recipient or a non-DACA recipient, get people to register. Here's this registration application. Register to vote. Because if you register to vote, get the right people in there, then maybe we can get something that is unheard of a bipartisan approach to immigration that will see that 
all you DACA folks who've been in it, been at it for 10 years are good citizens, are worthy of a pathway to citizenship, and we can get that that reform needed to allow DACA to be permanent and have you DACA holders be be given that pathway to citizenship and have an overall just we need that that broad overhaul of the immigration system. And the easiest thing to do would be to let the DACA folks become citizens. But we only get there if we have the vote. When I say we, I mean people like minded who want something done with immigration. Register. You still have time. People are already voting, but early voting has begun. But you can still register up to 15 days before the actual vote. So don't despair. There's time. Go out there. Register to vote. Tell them that Uncle Emil sent you. Uncle Emil? Uncle Emil sent? Yeah. Uncle Emil. Hey, and uh, before we get to, we, we have our guest coming in today. It's Filipino American History Friday. That's what I call it. I'm going to call it Filipino American History Friday. We're going to talk about other things, and I'm going to bring them on soon. But first, I also want to talk about this thing. We had the opening last night of The Conductor. The Conductor is Ishmael Reed's new play. Ishmael Reed, playwright, novelist, author, poet, renaissance artist, renaissance literary artisan. Is that, that, that you know, I might describe that. Or that may, may be applicable to Ishmael. He wrote The Conductor. It is one man's view of, of race history in America. And it is a history. And if you want to know why people want to stop people from learning our history, it's because there's a lot that we don't know about. And they'd rather keep you in ignorance than allow you to know the truth. And the truth is in... A lot of truth is in that play, The Conductor, by Ishmael Reed. Now, people say, Emil, I know you have a small part, Emil, in it, because you're you're a small guy. I know, Emil. I, no, it's a small part because I play a, I play a Fox News type commentator, kind of like, uh, I call it a Tucker Carlson in brownface. My wife saw it last night. And she said, uh, Emil, are you supposed to be Dinesh D'Souza? No, Dinesh D'Souza went to Dartmouth. I went to another Ivy League. It's not Dinesh D'Souza. No, not Dinesh D'Souza. By the way, it's a virtual reading. You can be anywhere and see this play, The Conductor. It's at the theater for the newcity.net. Anyway, so Ishmael has written this play, and Ishmael's alter ego is the columnist, the main character in the play, The Conductor. He's a conductor of a new modern underground railroad. He has this new job because as, as a conductor, because as a colonist, he advocated for the progressive school board members who wanted to do a number of things in San Francisco, and he got fired. And because he got fired, he became a cause celeb of sorts, but he also became the target of conservative Asian Americans, Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, and he had this side gig as a conductor for a modern underground railroad. That is, you know, you remember the underground railroad. They, it's generally how blacks or how he, people in general were helping blacks escape to freedom. Well, now in this underground railroad, blacks run the railroad to help people who are under attack escape to freedom. Huh. Funny how those things turn it you know within time and you know if you belong in a in a society where there's conservative intolerance intolerance for progressive ideas and where there's like suddenly there's an international episode an international incident where a prime minister in india this is fictional but a prime minister in india does something like down an american spy plane causing Indian Americans here to be targeted and Indian Americans to flee. Ah, 
What happens to Indians? They seek an underground railroad, a passage to Canada, then India, or a passage to, in, to India. Well, that sounds like a Forrester novel. A, a passage to freedom. That's where the conductor comes in. Now, doesn't that make you want to see this? This, 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 this play that I'm in? It's actually a reading. And it's a lot of history, but it's history that you don't know about. And it's history that explains what happens when the conductor, the former colonist, talks to the Indian American conservative who is now on the run. And their discourse is engaging, informative, entertaining, too. I mean, there's other things, too. There's some hot sex in it, too. Oh, should I say that? There is some. Uh, well, it's all off screen. But but it, it's it's part of the story. It's called The Conductor. The Conductor, Ishmael Reed. Uh, it's at the theater for the new city.net. Go there, buy a ticket now. Tickets you get online. Hour before the show, they send you a link. You get the link. You go see the show. It's virtual. And, you know, a lot of people are kind of down on virtual. You know, they say, oh, you know, we're a theater. We do things live. Well, yeah. Have, have you seen the stats? Uh, I mean, I know we're still, we're not at the peak of where we were, but we are at around, what, 350 deaths a day on average in America, more than a million in two years or so. I mean, I heard someone at a box office tell me, oh, well, you know, we, we do live productions because we're out of the pandemic. We're not out of the pandemic. We're in the pandemic. We're coping with the pandemic. And some people are flaunting and, you know, they're, they're like given the pandemic, uh, you know, but they can't because not only is there the old variant, but there's a new variant coming in. And if you haven't been vaxxed, oh, shame on you. Before you go see, well, you can see the, the the conductor because it's virtual, but I I urge you to not just see the conductor, but I urge you to get your vaccinations. I've got five. I've got five shots now. I'm proud, proud of everyone, because they're not going to last long. Anyway, the conductor tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. Oh, what a show! And if you're on the if you're on the West Coast, hey, you know the whole evening ahead after you see the conductor, eight eight Eastern, five Pacific, the conductor, go to theaterforthenewcity.net, catch a show. I I am pushing it because I have a very small part, very small part. You'll say, Bill has a small part. Where is he? He's going to be here sometime. And Bill said he's going to be here. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah, you'll like it. You'll, you'll like the show. You'll like the show. The con a lot of history, a lot of entertainment. Ishmael reads the conductor theater for the new city dot net. Catch it now, please. Yeah, it, it runs through Sunday. So if you can't make it today or tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific matinee on Sunday. Yeah, you didn't want to see that football game. You want to see him kick around a meal. You'll like it. It's good. It's good. All right. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about the news and other things like uh, uh, Warnock and Walker and Parkland, the death penalty. And we're going to talk about that Trump rally. Oh, wait, no, that wasn't a Trump rally. Excuse me. Um, Trump's reply. I couldn't read my notes to the January 6th hearing. I don't know. Trump, Trump's lost it. I think he's lost it. But we're going to talk that, and we're going to talk history. I'm going to bring up my my guest here, Professor Daniel Phil Gonzalez, San Francisco State University College of Ethnic Studies Professor Emeritus. Uh, my good buddy, uh, Professor Dan. How are you? I'm good. Are Thank we? Uh, yep. Yeah, it, it, we're on. Uh, I see you. We're on. Yeah, we're working. It's 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 up. We, we it's, chilly. it's chilly in San Francisco, man. I know. Our, well, Our space heater went on. I couldn't believe it. 
you've got the look of fall to you. You know, we got. I, I, got, I do. I do. Yeah. I'm trying to hold on to my hair, but you know. Well, look, it's good to see you. Uh, I a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about October 18th. Today's the 14th, but it's we get into Filipino American History Month uh, for real on the 15th. All our all to ourselves. Uh, okay. Yeah, we share it. We share it with Latinos for a minute. Yeah, for about 15, 15, uh, 15 days. But uh, there are a couple of things I want to talk about first. This play I'm in, Ishmael Reads the Conductor, is about the reaction to the progressives who are on that San Francisco school board who got recalled. Also, the reaction to the recall of the district attorney, uh, Kesa, uh, Chesa Boudin. And my question to you is was that an overreaction an anti-woke overreaction to progressives or is that a trend is that because this play uh the conductor is about you know how there there was a re overreaction to these people what do you think uh yes yes i'm about 50 50 on this okay yeah. it was a it was a it was an overreaction OK, but the overreaction was from a segment of or segments of our uh, Asian American communities that have always occupied a rather uh, it's not even a center right position. I would say it's definitely a, a, a clear right position mm. that is not once again conservative. It is not it is not at all demonstrative of conservative values. Huh. It's uh, self-serving, is what it is. It is self-serving, no, and it's and not just it's not ideological. No. Yes, just as uh, remember the CCC, the 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 uh, uh, proposition uh, two hundred nine. The, the, oh yeah, yeah. You know, was uh, was based on uh, civil rights. They actually they actually called it uh, a civil rights uh, uh, legislation. Yeah, so, yeah CRI. Uh, and they yeah. cited MLK Jr. Uh, while they were pushing it. And the same thing is true here. It was self-serving. It was trying to get rid of, it was misogynistic. Okay, it was anti-woman, really, because the greatest uh, uh, beneficiaries of affirmative action policy has been white women, numerically, okay, and qualitatively. That's the case. But they voted, uh, you know, once again, educated white women voted in favor of 209. Yeah. So the way that I approached it was, okay, uh, is this a case of, the, with this, I approached it with this question. Is this a case of I've got mine and I'm going to shut the damn door on everybody behind me? Okay. Was it a conscious move or was it something that was uh, akin to... Uh, I, I I was able to achieve by merit. Yeah. And right. and, and so myself. since I was able to achieve by merit, everyone else should. Now, certain segments uh, of our ethnic communities under the Asian American Pacific Islander rubric, which is always a troublesome problem, right, to be addressing people categorically that way, because we're very different across right. the board. Uh, but there's certain segments that have been consistently Okay, uh, taking the position that affirmative action favors certain groups that don't deserve those benefits. That's it. We deserve those benefits, merit only. Okay, that's that's where it comes from. So and we're so facing that now. There's going to be at least two cases, right? Yeah. Uh, this uh, Supreme Court session, um, and uh, we're going to have to <laughs> we're going to have to wait and see how folks handle this. But. Yeah. Well, it looks like, um, and that and that issue of affirmative action, how uh, white conservatives took Asian Americans and used them as proxies to 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 try to defeat affirmative action. And it looks like they're going to be successful. Yes. At the court level. Yes. And if it happens, um, it's going to change. It, 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 well, I don't know if it's, I, I those groups that those groups that have you, you know you've been writing about this for decades. I, I remember reading articles that you wrote uh, from afar. I mean, when 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 you and the family were over on the East Coast or in the Midwest, and and because this issue has come up so many times, you know how old is two oh nine at this point? Right, that was a uh, that was the nineties. Yeah, that was the nineties. Uh, 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 
uh, initiative, yeah. and it passed. It passed overwhelmingly in California, right? It was an anti-affirmative action. And I had argued that at least two-thirds of it was going to be rendered unconstitutional by California law, and the only place that it could be challenged would be that it was uh, uh, that it was constitutional by federal law, and they didn't take it there. So it didn't. It never made up. Man, it never made it up to the, the to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. See, but the fact that it won and it has been the law in California, some people would argue that. Well, see, you know, we 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 we've gone without affirmative action at places like UC Berkeley. We're better. It, it seems like we're better off, aren't we? Actually, actually, uh, two thirds. My point was two thirds of two hundred nine was struck down by the courts. It could not be enforced. Oh, it could right. not be enforced. They, uh, you know, uh, I call him. I, I call him Dolph, but but his real name is Dan Lundgren. He was the oh, attorney. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and 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 he tried to enforce uh, the uh, two hundred nine against uh, a Santa Clara County uh, provision that counted people uh, in their uh, county and city employment, right? Uh, they, they, they counted ethnicity. And he said, under 209, you can't count ethnicity. You right, can't but, look at race. But still, Dan, part of it is still... And he, and he lost. But, he but lost. The part of it is still good, like, for example, at UC, right? So uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying that I, I know that there's still some trouble with uh, admissions at UC, but I mean, the, the people who would like to see affirmative action go away would say, California's had to live with it. I guess, uh, you know, the nation would have to live with it, learn to live with it too. Yeah. I, I you know, uh, UC has had the UC system, you know, but, but Berkeley always leads off, right? I mean, there was only one time when, when other campuses got heavily involved, and that was Davis, UC Davis with the Bakke case. Right. in the late 70s and and the supreme court the u.s supreme court did in fact take that case up and and their decision was uh you know discrimination uh, racism still exists right. so you can use racism but you can't use it as a primary yeah. element they, they a primary it. factor and, and that is the law the law of the land that's right you can use it uh as a factor you can use it you can't have quotas Quotas right. are illegal. Exactly. That's all it did was strike down right. quotas. Oh, right. I, we got into this big thing about affirmative action, but th that's an aspect of what's in this play, the uh, conductor. Uh, conductor. But you know, it's it's also filled with history about all these instances where people of color have had to fight for these things and how they've been beaten down and they fought again. And he also talks about Asian American history and how. Asians and particularly Indians in America, they they were excluded just as Chinese and Filipinos were. And in fact, simultaneously with Filipinos, yeah. there were signs all over Northern California, including Sacramento. No, uh, no dogs or Filipinos or and they said Hindus. No they Hindus. Used, they used the nomenclature Hindus, and obviously that was a reference to Indians. But yeah, right. I mean, but 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 they. We were we were lumped in. The people saw, Every, yeah, the Filipinos and the, and the Indians together because there there was wasn't there something in 1917, I believe. Okay, we, uh, concerning which group? Concerning Indians. Or yeah, Indians. Uh, in fact, it led to uh, uh, Bhagat Singh. The Bhagat Singh case is that what you're thinking about? I th I think I I just it's it's just a reference in this play, and that's how stock full of history. Uh, this play is and uh, the conductor. And I, I think it's just interesting because most people don't know this. I mean, but if you are understand that we have all at some point been under attack and have been singled out and have been excluded, uh, it makes you say, hmm. Well, it's an element that once again, both of us have covered you in your journalism and uh, me in my classes uh, yeah. that we showed the long the long-standing, right, consistent exclusion of not only uh, Asians generally, but specific Asian groups. There, there were specific laws 
uh, against Asians. Uh, there were general generalized laws as well, like the anti miscegenation laws, right? Right, right. But, but then uh, Filipinos had the audacity to challenge the anti miscegenation laws by saying, "We're not Orientals. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. we're Indo Malays. We're Malays. M A L A Y S." Yeah, so we, that law doesn't apply to us, and a judge in Los Angeles actually agreed with that for a moment. Yeah, that for a moment. The, for a moment, you know. Yeah. And but but the, the California legislature took less than a year to add Malay <laughs> to the list of excluded groups. Right? Yeah, uh, we're talking they, about Jews, son. <laughs> yeah, when, when they when they really want us, they they will include us when they when they really want us. So right. Our, well, so I, I only want to bring up this these issues here because the conductor is chock full of these that uh, issues that they mention and that they remind us of, and it's uh, all in this one little hour and fifteen minute reading. If you go to theaterforthenewcity.net, okay, on to the next subject, and this is uh, in keeping with our topic of Filipino American History Month. But the first 15 days is Filipino, or is we share it with Hispanic Heritage Month. Right. And so. kind of appropriate because we got the same colonizer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, because it, it could be uh, for Filipinos, we can we can have both sides of the month. The first yeah. yeah. Days, That's right. I, I like to call myself an ass panic sometimes. <laughs> Asian, Asian Hispanic. Oh. Uh, uh, you know, they're actually, that's two A's, two A's, yeah. <laughs> not, not two S's, two A's. Aspanic, <laughs> Aspanic. So, uh, Dan, all right, so this has come up in the news. I'm sure you've seen this. L.A. City Council, Nuri Martinez. Oh, the, God. The president of the city council. Oh, had man. She, she resigned and was going to be a regular council member. And then yeah. some, someone said, oh, no, 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 no. You got to get off. And then there were two other people, Gil Sadio and Kevin DeLeon, who were on the council in on this this privately recorded call or private conversation that was recorded and leaked out. They said some, you know, some racist things. And my, my question to you is. And, 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 what, and not even guardedly racist. I mean, they were just plainly, plainly and blatantly racist. And they made, yeah. it was uh, it was OK. What's your question? Well, I like you said. Let, we'll just. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the the slur, but there was a slur against African Americans, and there was and and um, a white gay parent had a I believe a step uh, had an adopted child who was African American, and there was a slur about the the child, and then there was a slur against Native Indigenous people, the Oaxacans, and so. That's the the damning part, the racist part. Nuri Martinez was the worst. She's the president of the city council. She was forced to step down bit by bit. First, she just said, I'm going to, you know, just be a council member and give up the presidency. And then she just left altogether. She could not withstand it, or withstand the pressure. The other two are there and... Cedillo and De Leon, and the, there is a, there are calls for them to resign. Should they I think resign? Appropriately so. I think appropriately so. Should they resign? Yeah, yeah I think so. They were. Uh, they should have come out with criticism. Yeah, they didn't. They, Martinez, well, they, and they they didn't do that. So that means that they were complicit, and they yeah. did engage in the discussion. They did not come to the defense of the people who were slurred. They did not come to a criticism. Of Martinez, so hey, get the get off, get well, off. All right, playing devil's advocate here. Uh, they didn't say anything. They didn't do anything except be quiet. Is it too? I mean, one of them is already out. Cedillo is going to be gone at the end of the term because he got primaried out. De Leon is considered uh, a leader in the Hispanic community. And is still has. Has he apologized? Him. Has he criticized Martinez? I haven't heard anything. No. Well, that's pretty representative of a, a long, a long tradition of anti-African American attitudes within 
certain Latino communities. I've been well, witness to it. I've been witness to it as a member of ethnic studies uh, faculty. I've been witness to it in terms of my interactions with people in the community around political circumstances um, and everyday language. You well, know, you're, people, you're right. You're right in the sense that uh, they, they were meeting at um, some private session to discuss how to get more Latinos onto the city council. And it's a, 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 how to drop the district lines. Right. And it looked like they were going to do so at the expense of African-American representation. So what right. you're saying kind of. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there is a, there's always a, a power thing. I mean, look, look at what happened in San Francisco, right? There was going to be a redistricting lines and, and it could adversely affect the certain Asian ethnic groups. Um, well, and well, and it, go ahead. Yeah, they did, they did have to succumb to the criticism. So there were slight, there were slight changes. You know, I had to, I had to look up and see what the third change was to make sure that, uh, you know, what, which district I was in, but yeah. It happens. Uh, it happens everywhere. People, you know, politics is a contest for power, purely and simply. It's a contest for power. So you're going to get in 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 uh, areas where uh, you know th certain districts uh, have a, a substantial uh, number of voters. There's going to be attempts to shave those things. I mean, you know, that's what gerrymandering is all about, right? And and that's been the the most consistent device. Used by so-called conservatives to uh, to to uh, uh, re uh, reduce the influence of uh, more voters uh, from uh, the ranks of uh, people of color. All right. So the funny thing is, is what it does also is pit people of color against each other. Yeah, you absolutely. Had, you had let, uh, the Hispanics against the blacks, and then you had the slurs in this conversation and the calls from the community. One of the calls came from, or, you know, a, a segment of those, uh, you know, calls for the resignation of these uh, city councilmen, the Hispanic city councilmen were in fact, Asian Americans, the Asian American uh, victory Alliance. They've come out to say, Cedillo has got to go. De Leon has got to go. Uh, do you think they are making a power play move here for maybe an alliance with African Americans? Both. Both are a possibility. Um, there are a lot of Asian American groups, and, you know, uh, I'm most familiar with people of, you know, our generation. Uh, but a lot of those people are, you know, termed out and also pretty much retired. They're still very active in the political process, right? But they're now the elders uh, that get consulted with. And, and, and uh, anyway, uh, so there's a new generation coming up. But there, there are a lot of progressives in, in that group, you know, people who are uh, uh, in mid-career, you know, in terms of their professions and have, who have been active ever since even their high school days. You know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of younger people who started becoming very politically active in their high school days. Uh, and even more so during their uh, during their college days, and we're not talking about the old style, you know, nineteen fifties politics or campus politics, where it's a popularity contest. I mean, uh, the the campus politics is actually reflective uh, yeah. of uh, it's a, it's a microcosm, really, yeah. of national and international politics. All right, so if the calls are out there, the AAPI Victory Alliance is saying, yeah, Cedillo De Leon out. You got Martinez already out. You got three new members. It sounds like they are trying to form this alliance to get more blacks and Asians or blacks and Filipinos into the council. I think possibly. I possibly. I, I think most of the people, uh, you remember the battle between uh, that was played up by civil rights, or, or aging civil rights leaders in San Francisco. It was a, uh, uh, Eric Marr was being cast as a racist and anti-black yeah. uh, because uh, Professor, uh, well, actually Dr. Ackerman, who was the uh, superintendent of schools at the time, uh, Eric Marr had some criticisms about what where her priorities were yeah. uh, you know, as, a, as a top administrator of the school district. 
and uh, people who were civil rights uh, champions came out and uh, painted Eric as a uh, and and you know he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, so I know him really well. Is my point. And and there's not there's not a racist bone in that guy's body. Same thing is true of his brother, who's who's a current you know supervisor. But but uh, uh, they painted him very badly, and it 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 got played in the uh, in the weeklies. You know. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so what what do you think? Uh, I, I I guess until we hear from Cedillo or uh, or or uh, De Leon. Uh, can they write it out, or is the community pressure of a, of a of a magnitude that they that they will not be able to stand on the sidelines without you know coming out apologizing or saying something strong about what happened? I'm surprised. I'm surprised they haven't apologized yet. I mean yeah. that 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 gives me great concern because it means that there's not much pressure coming from Latino and and Chicano communities. Yeah, we, you oh, know. Yeah. The other thing that's wrong is that we don't know exactly who leaked it. We don't know what kind of secret meeting, secret phone call this was. We don't know, you know, when, it, I mean, it just suddenly it, it, it was released and, and then uh, Nuri Martinez, you know, got, got the worst of it. Uh, one thing to say is that because it had to do with redistricting, the attorney general's office, Rob, that's Bonner, right. yep. America, he's looking into it now or there, his office what kind of impact do you think that's going to have? <laughs> that's the first thing I thought of. And I actually had a conversation with his former uh, chief of staff, uh, Dean Grafilo. Uh, and, and, and we both agreed that there's so much stuff on, on Mr. Bonta's plate right now. It's unbelievable. And so for, for you know, even at the national level, right, with this, uh, with abortion and all that stuff and the possibility of, of, uh, of uh, affirmative action decisions by the court. And so, and, and he's up for re-election, right? He's he, he, very short term well, for him. Of, yeah, all of this is a way, the way I see it is, this is his way of campaigning. This yeah. His way, this is just the campaign, right? He doesn't, he's not doing the retail stuff as much, although he is out there. But if you do, do your campaigning by taking action, by busting, That's right. Busting the fentanyl dealers, busting or making sure that the gun gun weapons uh, uh, or uh, assault weapons gun ban, you know, right, right, you know, you know, so forth and so on. The you know, he is doing the, 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 the Supreme Court will probably strike that down, but but you know, you got to go for it anyway. Yeah, I mean, this, this is predominantly an anti anti assault weapon state. You know, we yeah. we were the first guys to run that stuff up in the eighties. Yeah, after the Stockton school shooting. Yeah. That's yeah, right. And, Correct. And it, and it was Feinstein who still yes. in office. Yes. And but she couldn't keep it from sunsetting. She couldn't keep it. You know. No, it was a ten year. That's right. It was a ten year ban. Yeah, but uh, you know the thing is, uh, funny how these things change. I mean, the you know when, when the going's good, you got to get it because because as situation changes, look at immigration. You know the sixty five immigration law. I mean to to, to have that back. It would seem like a fantasy now to have that kind of bipartisanship on him. Right, 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 right. Well, see, it wasn't perceived. We weren't perceived as a threat yet. Not yet. You know, the numbers, the numbers were low. Right. And 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 they they really needed uh, instant right technicians. Yeah. And so, uh, particularly the the Asian migrants uh, or the potential for Asians who were really highly educated. Right. Uh, and then, you know, people ask me, well, why these groups? Why particularly Hong Kong, the Philippines and India? And I said, what is the medium of language at the university level? And they said, oh, <laughs> yeah, people, people from South Korea send their kids to the Philippines for education because of the quality of, at the big universities. Right. And because English is the medium of instruction, man. Yeah. yeah. Same thing is true of Indonesians, Malaysians. I, I've met all kinds of kids when I'm in the Philippines, and I usually I'm at UP Diliman. Yeah. I met all kinds of kids that from from those countries uh, whose parents finance their educations in the Philippines. And that is the virtue of colonialism. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I, there are a lot of ironies. There are a lot of ir ironies to being Filipino. That's definitely true. That is uh, absolutely true. All right. Uh, with that, let's let's move on to the the next issue. I we talked about this a lot um, in our previous show. You know, I'm I'm not anti Draymond Green. I'm pro Golden State Warrior. Right on, right on. The fact that the Warriors. Uh, allow Draymond Green to get away with that punch. Oh, Green. sure. It's very penalty light. We don't even know what the fine is going to be yet. You know. Yeah. No suspension. I, yeah, I said yeah, yesterday, yeah. it reminded me of the way the GOP embraces Trump. Oh. And the GOP supporters. They say, oh, I know Trump is bad, but we can win with him. We, we win with Trump. <laughs> and that's exactly what sports fans or warrior fans are saying oh i don't like what draymond green has done to jordan pool poor jordan pool but we can't win without draymond we need draymond, we need draymond. well that, you know to, to, we should be completely transparent with your audience you know we we've had this conversation two times or three times well, wait a and, minute. And, but, and, well, and and i didn't go that far all i said was look at you got to look at the role that he plays that he's one of the greatest defense. defense I, I am going that far. He, the guy, Draymond Green, <laughs> you know, first of all. I should, I should be more serious about this. It's true. He should be penalized to a greater well, extent. Well, here's the thing. Uh, it's not that you should be more serious about this, but uh, I take violence seriously. And, and Asian American Pacific Islanders who've been uh, more than 11,000 who've been victims of, of, violence of transgressions violence including death over the last two and a half years during the pandemic casual violence if you if you want to count what Draymond did a full force punch to jordan Poole, casual violence you can't condone it it's 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 not it should be a zero tolerance uh factor uh it, at the workplace because some people say oh well you know these are big guys they play sports this is what you do in sports this was practice. This was not, you know, like going at it and, you know, punching in the throes of, of, of play, of uh, throes of doing the, you know, the athleticism of the sport. This was, they were, they, there was like a second of downtime. He was allowed to, you can watch the video, TMZ. You can see, uh, you know, Draymond Green thinking, okay, do I punch him? He comes up to him, gets pushed, and then he comes in with the, you know, with the counter. And, uh, I just think you got you got premeditation there. You got the video, and he doesn't even get a suspension. He comes back and plays tonight. He right. Comes That's plays. right. Yeah, yeah. And he's going to get his ring ceremony. And as I said yesterday, Jordan Poole, uh, he's not only going to get his Big Max extension contract for doing well. He's going to get it because he's good. But for doing what he, he could get the franchise, I think they realize he could own the franchise. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You're talking about going and taking a, pers a lawsuit action. Uh, yeah, he could get something out of it. But, you know, they're going to. He get a whole lot more than a max contract. And that's all that the top NBA players get, maybe. But yeah, yeah. Consider this. He could own the franchise. When you get to a level, right? When your source of income is the franchise, yeah. right? and you know the only reason Draymond Green is a rich man today, he might get some endorsements and things like that, but it's because he is paid handsomely by this franchise, and it makes him not just a player; he's a partner. But he's yeah, a, you know that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, he's a bad partner though when he starts beating that's up right. young players. Right. So I think he just uh, like ripped up his, or they just ripped up his partner ticket and say, I don't know if it's going to last more than a year. Uh, one guy, uh, Tim Kawakami, uh, used the divorce analogy, and that might be an apt one in this case for you know a year trial separation. But I think it's important that Draymond uh, that we look at this and see it for what it is. I'm never going to root for him. I, I just you know. I, I maybe I, I can forgive, I can't forget, but I, I also think I take violence seriously. And you see older Asian Americans get beaten up, you see Asian Americans get beaten up. Uh, you got to take violence seriously. 
and you take a punch like this and you don't take a stand on the punch on Jordan Poole, I say shame on the Golden State Warriors and shame on the NBA. There will be eternal shame on Draymond Green. I mean, it's not going to happen. You know, things are going to happen to him. It's, it's not going to happen to him. And, and, um, and everybody's going to turn around and say, okay, so what? You know, I mean, what happens if he starts being the, quote, victim of uh, some serious fouls? Um, oh, you know, yeah. from other players. Well, you know, that that could happen too. I don't I don't know. I think that, you know, at some point you just hope, I mean, Steve Kerr, the coach, was, was you know, saying how, how wise Jordan Poole was, you know, and how, <laughs> how mature <laughs> beyond his years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how mature Jordan Poole is considering that the Warriors couldn't be honest and they try to keep this inside. They, 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 you know, that's what they're, they're more mad that this was leaked out. That's right. That, 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 that should tell you everything. You know, like I said in my column, uh, uh, if a crime is committed and people want to keep it inside, that sounds to me like Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, let's keep it in your refrigerator. Let's not, let's not, let's not it. Oh, God. And that to me. Oh, man. All right, all right, let's move on. Next subject. Next subject. You know, there's a susp- there was suspicion that there was cannibalism associated with Dahmer. So, you know, I don't know if you want to go that way. No, yeah. Well, so. There's no suspicion. <laughs> not, not, not oh my god all kind of jokes that i they're no, so bad they're so bad i'm gonna have to let them go no the guy was a meat eater the guy was a oh meat eater. no god. Uh, right. so dan let's talk about uh now this is this is the a, a good topic to talk about the parkland murderer uh, oh murderer. yeah life he Life other like, than, uh, yeah, the death penalty. death penalty. All right, so look, I bet you know my stance on the death penalty, right? Well, uh, it's not a hard guess. Uh, if you are anti-violence, uh, the very likelihood, at, to the degree that you are, um, you know, you're going to be uh, pro-life in the sense uh, that you're going to be anti-capital punishment. Yeah, and, and that is a very Catholic thing to do. If you really want to be truly Catholic, mm. you, you can't say I'm anti-abortion and then on the other hand say that you're you're okay with capital punishment. Right. I mean, I yeah, that's a good guess. You're right. You're right on target, Professor. You're right. I am, in fact, and have been uh, anti-death penalty for a long, long time. And I, I was listening to... Um, one of the fathers, Gutenberg, Fred Gutenberg is his name. Right, yeah. Uh, he's a, a, a very vocal uh, advocate for the Parkland families. Also an Asian American, I think related to Peter Wong. Um, you know, sweet kid who was killed. Uh, look, my heart goes out to all of them. And and this is the way, this is the only way that you can, you can talk about this. That yes... You can feel your passion for your family member who was killed, and darn it, you can have this this anger. But this is why you're not on a jury. This is why you don't decide for the rest of the people, the citizenry, about what sh- what to do with the penalty of the this Cruz guy, Nicholas Cruz. And I listened to Gutenberg. He was on television. I heard what he was saying. He doesn't like the mental health defense. He doesn't like any of that. He doesn't think that mental health excuses you. Okay, but why the call to get some guy's life? You know, it's like that. That and he wasn't alone. I mean, there were a lot of the a lot of the families. Yeah, the Parkland families. Uh, were were very disappointed, and right. they were they were actually distraught over over the decision. I understand. Look, and and if I if one of my kids uh, were you know was victimized and killed, I'd feel the same way. I would feel the same way, and I would speak out. But you know what? I would know that the jury was right, and all it took was one. Right? It just, just took one juror. Well, I think uh, the news I got was that there were three. Were there three? Okay. Yeah, yeah there were. Know. Well, you're right that it only takes one because it, it has to be a unanimous decision. But I think right. there were as many as three who were against it, 
And I could understand that, particularly from a Florida jury. There's going to be a lot of a lot of Christians, a lot of Catholics who who are in fact pro life and and who are anti capital punishment. Well, I mean, California was anti capital punishment. Yeah, and, and it, it it was it was completely illegal to do capital punishment for several years. Yeah, um, on, and it started during the uh, first Brown administration, uh, first uh, 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 Jerry Brown administration, his first first eight years, and. Um, uh, it took a, a statewide initiative, another initiative, yeah. to uh, to restore a limited form of capital punishment. Yeah, I I think that it's just wrong to kill or to take someone else's life or to be to be so distraught by violence and then say, "I am so distraught by violence, let's go do it again to, towards someone else." I mean, it's it's an it, eye for an eye. It's simplistic eye for an eye. Uh, uh, judgment and yeah. and it and it has more to do with vengeance than it does with justice. Um, you know, you got to you got to deal with the law, and and if the law allows for uh, life imprisonment without possibility of parole, um, and uh, particularly if there are processes where uh, the 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 prisoner, the convicted person. Um, uh, is uh, is reminded on a regular basis of the gravity of their act, right, and the harm that it's caused uh, to the families affected. Uh, and I think I think that's what, that should be done all the time. I think the person should be ha forced to reflect on the, on the crime. Yeah, I I think, yeah, I don't know what happens to Cruz now in terms of where he, you know, how he lives out his life. He is going to live out his life, but you see, you're right. If, if there was something like uh, some kind of contemplation where, where he has to be reminded of this every day, that would be, you know, you it was it's sort of like you put people away to rehabilitate, but they never rehabilitate. You put people away for life. What are they going to do with their lives? You don't just warehouse them. I, I would like to see something, maybe maybe so, something. Well, you, you couldn't put it in the law, but it would be nice if there was something that said, okay, he's going away for life, but there's something else he does so that the families can have, can feel a little better because it's totally normal for them to, to feel the kind of anger because they think that, you know, my kids were shot and this guy gets to live. It's not fair. It isn't fair. Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it isn't it's, fair. It's justice. It's, it's yep. It's yep. Justice. Okay, let's go. Let's go on to the next. Uh, uh, the next one, Warnock and Walker. They're debating tonight. <laughs> the, the midterms are important, and it. it no the, kidding. The midterms in Georgia, Wisconsin, uh, in Nevada. The, would would the, you say? Would you say that this midterm election, uh, and in national as well as statewide effects, can you remember another midterm election? that's as important as this one you know midterm elections are usually something people skip they usually think that's right oh, that's right you know, it's just a referendum on the president it's not you know it's not a big deal but this one's a big deal because if if the the congress is so split uh you cannot uh, it, you can determine everything by the makeup of both the House and the Senate, and it's better to have the majority in the Senate than the House, is what I'm learning. Or what is? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. and that's why uh, Wisconsin, well, Georgia, yeah. Nevada, and uh, the other place. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is one. You yeah. know, Ohio is a possibility. Oh, Ohio too. Yeah. All right. So those five, those five, but definitely. Yeah, that's, there's a, there's five or six. You know, yeah. I thought Arizona, but man, uh, Katie Hobbs is uh, who? <laughs> who? <laughs> wait, she's, wait, not even a, she's not doing appearances, and she's refusing to debate. She says there's no there's no way that you can have an intelligent conversation with that person. Uh, with, with, with Carrie Lake. Yes. Yes, but, uh, is, I I didn't see the polls in Arizona, but I, I I gather that she has a slight lead. Yeah, she well, and and the way that uh, Hobbs is playing, uh, I I suspect that lead could grow. Oh so, well, that would be 
Good. I hope so. I like Katie Hobbs. People got to know her when she. No, no. I'm saying Katie Hobbs is behind, and she's going to be behind. I, she, I think she's oh. going to be. She's going to lose more ground. Ah, well. Well, general, I, you know the the I, in between media, right? Uh, and the, what little moderate media there is, right, that tries to strike a balance. Even yeah. PBS, in other words, right, is saying we don't we don't get what Hobbs is doing because she's not she's not touring the state. She's not making nice with the with the voters in the burbs and the rural areas, and she's not debating. So, so just from a factual point of view, right? See, I I was wondering why we were hearing more about the Kelly race than the Hobbs race. That's right. When I hear about the Hobbs race in Arizona. It's only that oh, Carrie Lake is sort of like coming up is is close, or and sometimes she's ahead, sometimes she's behind. It's neck and neck. I didn't hear about this thing about Hobbs. I thought Hobbs was a good was a good candidate, but I, uh, you know, maybe she feels like if Kelly's so far ahead, it appears that he is, then maybe she doesn't have to bother as much. I don't know. Maybe I'm speculating. Uh, the, the other, the other races are, are interesting because I think, uh, Warnock and Walker, you got the preacher and the, uh, <laughs> the football, the, the former football. football player that likes to talk about pregnant cows. Yeah, the football philanderer. Uh, I <laughs> I like Warnock. He's with the Ebenezer Baptist Church. We'll see what he has to say. I know I heard that there's stuff about him that uh, they're going to release. There's stuff on everyone, but right. the, the good guys uh, tend to uh, overcome that. Uh, the bad guys, like Walker, I don't know how he overcomes this except with money from Republican super PACs. And, and they've been getting it. And that and that is a problem. That is a problem yeah. with these Republican Republican super PACs can say, "Okay, let's just put some more money in, and and we'll we'll just bypass that." And well, did you see the two clowns that were on either side of him while he was talking about when he was doing his bull, his bull oh, and and cow? Yeah, Scott, yes, yes. Stop, he's Scott on Tuberville was standing there, man, and oh, and he was doing that story, and they were going. They, you could tell they were trying to not be there. They were trying to be in freaking visible, you know. Well, but it was I, terrible. I, I thought think, it was funny as hell. I think uh, Herschel Walker is. Uh, he's well, he, a, said, he said, "I'm not that smart." I know he's a guy who wants to be manipulated. He said, "I'm here." Manipulated. I'm here. You know, we know how it was. I'm not this, but they they like me. They want a figurehead. I'm a figurehead. I'm popular. Vote for me, because I'm going to do anything that these these guys pulling the strings will say. This is a bad thing mm -hmm. about about Walker, and you know, it reminds me of Manny Pacquiao a little bit. <laughs> I, when I, when Manny Pacquiao was was popular when he was first coming on the scene, I thought, watch out, he's so popular. He's a man of the world. He could be anything. And I would talk to really smart Filipino analysts and they'd say, you better watch out, Emil, because Manny Pacquiao, uh, he's not that smart. He'll do anything that anyone tells him to. And yeah, thanks for the compliment. I mean, you know, about, you know, uh, really. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, you probably said something to me. I, 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 I sure as hell did. <laughs> I'm talking about someone else. Uh, another uh, okay. If it was you, I would have said you. But okay. I, just, I, just, I, just, I was in Hawaii. I thought you were just trying to disguise it so that we look less, less, uh, less fellow traveler. You know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, like we're not in collusion. Or yeah, that's right. right. There it is. <laughs> well, I, I and look and and to this day. I regret sort of my overweening like for uh, Manny Pacquiao at the beginning. Not now. I mean, it didn't take much, though. All you had to do was see his homophobia and to see that he is not that smart and he will do what anyone will tell him. That's what I see in Herschel Walker. That's what I don't like. And I hope that Warnock, the reverend, Ebenezer Baptist Church, MLK's church. I hope he prevails in the debate tonight. All right, next, uh, let's talk about let's talk about January six briefly. Uh, Trump is Ooh. that was a big that was a big deal, but they saved it for last, and that was good because I, I actually kind of was not with it for the entire hearing until they showed the videos. 
and the videos were emotional. It's it's like watching the Draymond Green Jordan Poole video. You watch the video <laughs> and you're into it. You know, you watch the video of January 6th, you say, damn, how do those, you know, look at Nancy Pelosi in action. Look at her, you know, saying she's going to punch out Trump. I, I, I actually like the fact that they showed that because it showed that they were acting like they were going to take care of our government and get it to the finish line. Meanwhile, Trump's in the White House. It makes Trump look bad. So what is your overriding, what's your, what's your thoughts on the subpoena, what it means, and if, if it oh. means anything? Uh, subpoena, it's demonstrative. It's 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 purely demonstrative. Uh, obviously, he can't afford, and his 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 representatives, his legal his lawyers, they can't afford to let him get up there, even if he'd want to. You know, because he's so nuts that and so egomaniacal that he thinks he can beat them by yeah. appearing. So that's the that's one thing that that's in favor of the possibility that he might appear. Mm-hmm. But I think. <laughs> I think people said over my dead body stuff like that. I mean, you know, they, they they're not going to let him do that. People on his side, but look at what he's done against his own interests and against the, the interests of the people who have warned him. They've well, all jettisoned. They've all been jettisoned, and 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 eighty percent of them have testified. You know, yeah, and, and, and so, yeah, yeah. The ones who have who are against him have all taken the fifth. They're, they're the loyalists, but there have been those who've testified against him. And, and the ones who have taken the fifth are, are setting themselves up for criminal prosecution once again. And there's not going to be anybody around to pardon them. So, okay, so it's it's really pretty ridiculous. I mean, if, you know, the general public, I'm uh, you know, disgusts me, you know, because they don't, once it starts getting a little complex, you know, just a little twist or turn here, right, they kind of tune out. You know, you know, they, they, they kind of tune out. And, and um, I think it's really important to understand that uh, the more that Trump says at this point, right, the, the deeper the hole he digs for himself. Well, so what I what I don't get still is how can people still be out there, Republicans, election deniers supporting Trump? Because it's still his party. No one has come out and said. Yes, that's right. Not his party anymore. I, yeah, look, he's got subpoena. He's well, got there are subpoena. some. There are a few ha- who are coming out and saying, you know, we uh, we got to stop supporting this guy. You know, he's done. But uh, you know, there are only people who I, I I suspect Romney will come out with some statements. You know, but, yeah, but it's people like that. Romney's in a safe position, right? He's never going to lose his position. Well, so, this is the thing. people who who are threatened, right? Who feel like we've got to embrace Trump or we lose. It's sort of yeah, like- that's because they they live in those states where the, that's the constituency that they're that they're dealing with. But the constituency should be smart enough to say, "Look at the facts. Yeah. We can't we can't support Trump? He's a loser." Yeah. It has I nothing mean- to do with smart. It has to do with it has to do with white supremacy for many of them. Okay, right. it has to do with the maintenance of power, even if they're not racist. Right there, and and they, they want to ignore the fact that one of the driving forces um, in, in their party is racism. One of the driving forces is misogyny. One of the driving forces is anti-LGBTQQ. Right, all of that stuff. It's the party of injustice. This is what they stand for. This is what they want. They want a society that is like the imagined society that existed in the 1950s. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, my my. My problem with that is, okay, you want that, but look at what Trump Trump represents and look at the hole he's dug for himself. He He's no longer, you can't, I don't think after yesterday, it's, I mean, I think it's less likely that he's a winner, but more a loser. And less likely, I mean, you, you could you used to be able to justify election denial by saying, well, we need Trump because he's going to win. But I don't know if you can still say that. And well, if you can still say that, then then it is a matter of... Uh, no, I, I think there's a lot of people that know he can't win. I think there's a lot of people. I think I think they're, they're imagining that the guy he's going to run against is, is Biden. And, and what a lot of the, you know, the reductionist perspective 
on 2024 is that, or even 20, you know, the, the midterm, is that the more you talk about Biden, the better it is for Republicans, okay? The more you talk about Trump, the, the worse it is for Republicans, the better it is for Democrats. That's a very reductionist position, but it actually is, uh, you know, it, it is feasible. Okay. So what you're, saying, what you're saying is this is the way the Republicans think they can win, and they'll exactly. go down. They'll go down with the ship because if they think Biden's the competitor, that's right. Then we can beat him with Trump, and and so that's why they stupid people like Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> Kevin McCarthy yeah. from California. I can't right? disagree with that. I can't disagree that McCarthy is really yeah. stupid. Yeah. Kevin McCarthy should know better. He's hanging in there. Yeah, well, what about the rest of those clowns? What about well, Cruz? I, what that's about the thing. I, I don't <laughs> understand. I, 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 think, I think that after yesterday, people should see, okay, we just need better leadership. The problem is there is no better leadership that can win. Cruz can't win. Lindsey Graham can't win. None of the other Republicans can win. Tom Cotton can't win. No one can win. Only Trump has that mystique of badness. Or <laughs> you know, he has a, he has a satanic appeal. Yes. But it, yeah, but it's it's like it's like Draymond Green. The Warriors feel they can't win without Draymond Green, so they you know they got to look okay. He's nah, I don't know if they nah. I I wouldn't take it that far. I I would say the Warriors would be concerned, right, uh, about the, the, the their quality of play without Draymond Green. I don't think I don't think they're at the point where we can't win without him. I don't think I, it's like I that. I think they I think they are. Otherwise I don't they, know. They got a lot of young talent, man. You see how these guys have been playing to watch that game the other day? I the Damn. Game. I they're good, but I I think, <laughs> I, I think the fact that they didn't they didn't suspend Draymond means they're playing it kind of cool. They're playing well, it. Kind of, yeah. There's there's a lot of, yeah. There's a lot of pol political and cultural elements to that. It's not it's not just about the, you know, whether or not they can win without them. I, I just think that really uh, uh, I, I want to see more Republicans after yesterday, after, uh, you know. Some, no, it ain't going to happen, man. I want to see more Republicans come out and say, yeah, uh, Trump can't win. Trump's a loser. I'm going to find someone else. I think that would be better and going down with your Republican candidate than saying I'm sticking with Trump. He's uh, he's the only guy who can win. And th that, that, that's look, 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 all you got to do is go back to 2016. My, my, my friend, yes. <laughs> go back to 2016. Everybody was looking, especially after the, you can grab them by the, and, yeah. and they thought that's it. It's over for Trump. And, and I said, you know, you guys aren't talking to the right people because the people that I've been talking to say things like, I just, you know, Hillary is terrible. Yeah. They just, they, they did not want to accept, particularly women on the liberal side, did not want to accept the level of hatred and yeah. animosity that it people had, including white educated women that, that they had against Hillary. And now it's about Biden is incompetent. He's too freaking old. Every time he stumbles or, or, you know, either verbally or physically, right, they say, look at that. You know, this guy, that's the president of the United States. Now, has, has he done almost everything right except for the withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? Yeah, well, that, was really, that was really Trump, uh, Trump aided. Right. Yeah, absolutely. He was the guy who started the, the withdrawal and he gave, and he made a date. He was the guy who set the date, you know, but, but see, that doesn't matter. What matters is what sticks in people's minds. And they saw all of these Afghans that helped us, you know, try to win uh, the peace and, and order in their own home country. And we didn't get them out. We didn't get, you know, we, we, we got many out, but we didn't get enough out. And, and now the country's gone to hell. You know, they're they're uh, the the wrong people are starving, and the and uh, the the wrong people are uh, in power. Yeah. Okay. All right. Look, we're not going to solve this. Let's see what happens there. Let's move on. Final <laughs> final topic today, because I I have to I've got a race in about five minutes or so, but let's talk about October eighteenth. This is the fourteenth. You have a show tonight. Or? Yeah, yeah, I do have a show tonight at five. Yeah. Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. The conductor, um, theater, <laughs> theater for the new city. I'm going to watch it over the weekend. So let's talk about 
October 18th, 1587, because that's when the first Filipinos uh, were, were said to have arrived in America, in the Americas, and they were ship hands of one Pedro de Unamuno, who was kind of like a, a second rate explorer who was trying to, you know, lost his boat, trying to get his boat, was in Macau, was sailing for Spain and made his way from Macau to what appears to be, and it's a question, either Morro Bay or maybe San Luis Obispo. <clears throat> yeah, somewhere around SLO. So uh, the Filipino American National Historical Society believes it was Morro Bay, but my question to you is how should people uh, feel about this? Was this the, this was the first Filipinos? I mean, they... First known contact, and it's documented because of the ship's log. Yeah. But if I'm and, Trump, right? If I'm Trump, I say, I like my first Americans. I like my first Filipinos to, to actually stay here and buy real estate. They did not. <laughs> they just stay here and they dropped some blood and they left. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the same thing that McCain said, or that uh, Trump said about McCain. I yeah. like prisoners who don't get captured. So, <laughs> what do you think about yeah, that? That is a horrible Trump imitation. I'm you, know? not I'm you, not got a much, you got to watch more Jamie Foxx. I mean, he, yeah. he does an amazing job with that. I swear. It's, it just makes me roll over and double up. He's so good. Well, he's but anyway. Good. All right. Yeah. So, so what, what do you think? The Filipinos came. They were ship hands. They, they I, I was uncomfortable with the claim, the way we treated the claim from the very time, first time that I ever saw it. First of all, before Fonz or any of those other folks knew about it, uh, I and a colleague of mine in Asian American Studies got, we received uh, a, it was the first time I ever got a message with a post-it on it. So it was a post-it, and it was from an anthropology professor, uh, Leo Kimnitz, Kimnitzer is his name. And, and the post-it said, is this the first contact of Filipinos with the, quote, new world, right? And we, we said, yeah, it, it, it appears to be the first contact, right? And, and it was entirely in Spanish. It was, a, you know, it was the ship's log in Spanish. But my colleague, uh, Malcolm Collier, uh, is very fluent in Spanish, you know, much better than I. And, and so we went through the damn thing and said, wow, this is pretty hot. But I didn't do anything with it because I wasn't the guy teaching Filipino-American history. It was somebody else. And so we just handed it over and said, here. So everybody st started getting excited. Uh, Marina Espina uh, did uh, some research on it. She was at the University of New Orleans. She's a librarian there. Uh, wrote articles on it, and it started becoming popularized. Right? She actually spoke at SF State. But yeah. she did not uh, connect to Pe Pedro de Unamuno. She was talking about the galleon trade to New Orleans, right? Or did she? Uh, 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 correct. Yeah, correct. But but um, because of the Unamuno uh, discussion, right, she was able to show that it fit within the timeline. Right. The problem was that the problem was that there are all kinds of, of uh, spaces, if we can call it that, where there wasn't a continuity of presence. OK. And, and that was also true of the landing uh, on the central coast of California by Unamuno. Uh, yes, the Filipinos landed, and and it's documented, right? But uh, and but I think that some of them stayed on and actually uh, blended in with the locals. Some of them say, I mean, do you know that there was a Filipino yeah. community? Do you, is there a trail of lumpia somewhere? You know, we ought to <laughs> we ought to do the DNA and find out. The problem is that there were Filipinos who arrived in the twentieth century that that blended in. And so if you were to do the DNA of the modern uh, Chumash, right, uh, Indians and, and other local groups uh, in that area, uh, then you'd have to get somebody who had had any contact with Filipinos from before, right, uh, the 20th century, even the end of the 19th century. So that's the problem. And, you know, uh, anyway, the point is, Without that continuity, see, the thing that the Chinese have in their favor is 
they actually, uh, it's a mandate, a cultural mandate that people write home and, and let everybody know where they are. And so you can go to uh, the gold country and see gravestones of Chinese, right? Uh, Filipinos, they may have arrived, you know, in the, in the 1580s, but what, so what? You know, if we don't have a continuity of record, right? They didn't leave a mark. Yeah. Leave a stone. It's, it's very difficult to, to, to say, here we are. This is proof that we're American or more American than everybody else. Because we were here we were here a couple hundred years before you all declared yourselves a, a, a nation, you know? Yeah. So uh, it's significant in a kind of bittersweet way then. Yes. It's, it's an, it's, I mean, it is an assertion, right, of of uh, presence but it is not a uh, it's not an assertion of continuity of presence you know yeah we were here but you know i mean it's not jamestown it's not plymouth Rock. <laughs> yeah but, it, but we were here yeah yeah, yeah. it's not it's not chinatown yeah yeah it, it's, it's, you know and it's what the filipinos do we we like you know it's not like we're driving through and like saying yeah, you know, it's yeah. What can you say that we're you know we deserve to be noticed as Americans? I mean, it's, still the reality is that the 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 known settlements, right, uh, are the New Orleans settlements that that Espina and other people have written about. In and, and that, uh, that was this like a hundred year gap, right? You know, and that was later, right? That, that was, was later. In, that was in the seventeenth century. That was later, and the big claim there is that, you know that they were there before. The United States was the United States, right? So, you know, which is but if if they only left like a uh, I don't know, like a, like a, a sissig truck stop or something, <laughs> put a, a, they had the they, shrimp dancers, man. You know, they had they had San San Mal San Malo. Remember that? Yeah, San Malo. But if if they only had something like that in Ma, in Morro Bay. Then we could say there it was. That, yeah, that, exactly, exactly. I but it but it still means something that we were here. Yeah, right? well, yeah, it does. And I, and there is the possibility, like I said, that people uh, jumped ship as they as you know. That's one of the ways that, that people, other people, especially other Asian American scholars, describe how Filipinos were established in the New Orleans area. You know, in actually in Baton Rouge and around the. Uh, you know the of uh, the, uh, the um, Baton Rouge uh, red the, stick, red stick. Yeah, that's right, red stick. Yeah. Like uh, what's um, that? You know the yeah, yeah, the stima, yeah. Stima. And the and the, you know the whole Bayou thing. I, I still oh. every time I think about this, I remember that interview that you did. Oh, yeah, <laughs> in I, went my to, presence. I went to New Orleans. I, I went seeking seeking the the uh, what is it the uh, well, no you had a you had a radio show on KBRG or something and we were yeah. doing a live interview yeah we, of, we, of, of a Cajun Filipino I was seeking the uh, Cajun Filipino and 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 he was really cool I you know what how do you what do you guys call yourselves and he said uh Kunas Kunas <laughs> Kunas Filipinos yeah. <laughs> Kunas Filipinos and we had to shut the sound off and we had to kill our mics we were laughing so hard you know it's funny as hell Oh my right. God! Well, listen, Dan. Well, look, um, we, we're about out of time. Uh, oh man! But I, no, you got to get you got to get prep. You got to do makeup. Uh, <laughs> well, look, uh, I I appreciate you coming on. Always a pleasure to have you on to talk about these things. Um, and always nice seeing you. I'll, I'll talk to you off camera. It's good to see you. Uh, hi, happy. Happy a solo Filipino American History Month on the fifteenth. It's ours alone. That's right. It's ours next week. And uh, and we'll talk more. We'll talk, come back again next week, right? Yeah. Okay. That's the plan. That yeah. is the plan. We can talk about why Elon doesn't want to fund Starlink. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's. Talk, I mean, we can talk about that. I. I you know. Elon, well, I'm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little short on cash. Yeah. You know. I got to buy Twitter. You know. <laughs> Oh, oh, wait, wait. So the Ukrainians could actually win if we, if we give them communication device. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Vlad, Vlad, Vlad might not dig it, man. You know. Shouldn't have said that. All right. So, all right, Dan. Next week, Dan, there he is. Daniel Phil Gonzalez, College of Ethnic Studies, Asian American 
studies history professor emeritus san francisco emeritus state. emeritus, emeritus. I'm, an old, I'm an old guy yeah san francisco state university all right dan take care thank, thank you. you all all power all yeah. power and i will watch the conductor conductor yeah conductor that's the conductor it's theater for the new city.net that's the plan uh, tonight saturday sunday matinee 3 p.m all right so regular listeners to the show know that you can catch this show on amk.com the repeat you can catch it on twitter at emil Amok. catch it on youtube the emil guillermo channel on youtube i know hey like us friend us do everything they ask because you know this is this is you know low this is not exactly a uh a uh high budget operation here uh, emil amok's takeout uh and appreciate everyone uh, being here. Uh, Cash the Conductor, Theater for the New City Down Now. I told you about that. 5 p.m. Pacific. 8 o'clock. It's a, it's a virtual reading. So you can be anywhere, anywhere in the world and catch it. Okay. So regular listeners to the show also know. I like to end this off with a little meditation, a little loving self-kindness. And, and I... I want to use as an example, the woman, the Asian American woman who won a genius award, the MacArthur genius award. And she said, I have, she said, I have imposter syndrome. This doesn't happen to people like me. It happens to someone else. She had imposter syndrome. She felt a sense of shame for what, for being Asian American. When you hear that, when you hear yourself say it, you hear someone else say it, this is when you have to go into Self-love mode, self-compassion, loving self-kindness, and turn it to yourself. But before you do, turn it toward others. See the love in other people, send it to them. And guess what? It comes back. And then use that, that love that comes back for self-kindness, self-loving, self-care. And you'll win. You'll, trust me, you'll win. So, as I wish for me, I wish for you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Emil Guillermo here. Can I say the conductor one more time? Hey, theaterforthenewcity.net. This weekend through Sunday. Catch it virtual reading i got a small part in it watch the replays on amok.com till then back on monday live 2 p.m pacific mahal <laughs>